Well, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. I pray you're all having an awesome day or evening wherever you are in the world. Today is a very special day. Not only are we getting into Josephus for the first time in, uh, I mean, I think we kind of touched on Josephus a little bit, but we haven't really died, you know, dove right into uh, the writings of Josephus. So we're going to start tonight. So this is exciting. Also, I'm not sure... Um, how many of you are listening to me on uh, mobile devices versus other devices? But if you're on like a, a, a bigger device, you might notice a change in quality, uh, a better quality that is. You know, uh, today we have a, a much a long, expe long expected um, and very long um Longly anticipated, if, if I can say that, upgrade to the internet service here today. So our internet service is much better than it was before. So you might notice that we have uh, the, uh, the quality is better. We're live streaming this now uh, at 1080p. It used to be 720, 720, so it's now 1080. So... Anyways, uh, let me know, guys, if you uh, if you notice any difference or uh, anything like that. But uh, yeah, Lord willing, we're going to keep on expanding this and probably multi-streaming to other platforms as well. Lord willing, uh, not seeing that we have a better internet service now. So praise God. Amen, amen, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings, everyone. As always, I pray that everything that we share today would be great blessing to you. Increase your knowledge of the scriptures, your knowledge of the things of heaven, your knowledge of the truth, and your relationship with God. Amen, amen. As always, I have a few comments I want to uh, read and respond to, as well as a critical thinking uh, little mini segment, and then we'll dive right into Josephus. In the live chat, I see we have Gnostic Native says, oh my God, I'm so excited. I love Josephus so much. And there's just no discussion commentary out there. I'm looking uh, forward to this so much. Thank you very much, Gnostic Native, and welcome and blessings to you. Uh, Psalm 94 says, shalom and blessings to all. Shalom, shalom, Psalm 94. As well as Kalamentos says, shalom, everyone. Shalom, Kalamentos. Billy says shalom. Shalom, Billy. Seek the Lord says shalom. Shalom, seek the Lord. Tammy says shalom all. Shalom, Tammy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Blessings multiplied, you guys. Great to see you. Tammy says, beautiful, Hannah. As always beautiful. There you go, Hannah. By the way, uh, Lord willing, we'll have Hannah come back a little bit later, usually like after the critical thinking uh, segment that we do. So, uh, Lord willing, Hannah will bless you a little bit more. Gnostic Native says, yes, that was so beautiful. Thank you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure Hannah is very thankful and grateful for your positive feedback there. Thank you. Um, going Nowhere says, good night. Uh, just <laughs> Yeah, good night. Just kidding. Um, woke up from a nap long ago, so I'm ready for the night. Oh, you're ready. Good. Awesome. And the Tower Time says, Shalom and howdy, brothers and sisters. Bless y'all. Shalom and howdy, brother. God bless you more. God bless you more. Okay. A few comments. A uh, handful of comments. I just want to go through some of these comments that I received in the past, in the past day, in the past 24 hours or so, uh, on various uh, videos on YouTube. So here is one comment. Uh, just 
trying to keep keep everything in order here. Um, just a second here. Okay. So here's a comment that was left on a, a, a short that a short video called Christians are robbing themselves. And the basic gist of that video is simply that, uh, you know, it says many, many times throughout the scriptures that if you obey the Torah, if you obey the commandments, you know, it, you will be greatly blessed. And so the uh, the point made in that video is that unfortunately a lot of people just say oh just throw the commandments out we don't need to obey the commandments at all uh, you know we just go by we just go by grace now we don't need to obey anything it's like you don't need to obey God at all just by grace and and so the gist of that video was a lot of Christians are robbing themselves in doing that because they're robbing themselves of the blessings that they can receive by obedience amen and so um, yeah so. We have time. Tim Exec, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, uh, says, I don't get it. Um, well, I just actually I just explained it. Right. So that's uh, that's really the uh, the gist of the video. A lot of Christians are just throwing the throwing the Torah out. And some Christians throw the entire Old Testament out. You're like, you know, that's none of it's for me today. You know, some Christians, believe it or not, some Christians even throw the teachings of Jesus out, saying, "Well, that was before the the in you know that was before the New Testament was instituted, so that's part of the Old Testament. So we're not going by the teachings of Jesus either." And once again, doing so, I believe Christians are robbing themselves. So that's really the bottom line to that video. That's uh, that's what I was getting at there. And here we are with another comment from our brother Corey. Corey says, what I don't understand, Brother Chris, is that that verse said God is slow to anger. When uh, I believe it was either Exodus or Leviticus, when Aaron took all the jewelry and made an ox out of it. And the Bible says that God has seen this has seen this and was very angry and was about to kill them until Moses suppressed him. Yeah, you know, um, here's the thing. Uh, there's a, there's a, a scripture that came to mind here. Let me see. I, I, you know, we're just kind of flying off the seat of our pants sometimes here. It's a lot of this stuff is, is uh, spontaneous. Uh, let, me just, uh, let me just pull this up. I think this is, this is really what it comes down to. And it is in Psalm 50. Okay, Psalm 50. And it says this. It says, these things you have done and I kept silent. I being God, okay. Uh, you thought that I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver. Uh, whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. So here's the, here's the thing right here. Right here. Uh, you thought I was altogether like you, and it's so, it's so easy, isn't it, to really kind of project ourselves onto God. Like, I think God is like this because I'm like this. I think God has the same kind of personality as I have. You know, or God, God thinks of things the way I think of things. And, uh, you know, we have to kind of step back a little bit and say, you know what? You know, I do believe God is slow to anger, especially considering what's going on in the world today. I think that he's slow to anger, very slow to anger. I mean, sometimes you wonder why we're not all just a pile of ashes right now. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, um, we don't know all the details of every situation that we read of in the scriptures and in history, even today. So, you know, perhaps God was putting up with a lot of things long time before uh, he finally just said, you know what, enough is enough. I'm going to judge you guys. So, yeah, um, we, we just have to uh, realize that God sees things different than we see them. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of times he is most of the time, if not all the time, he's very very patient and merciful and gracious to us and to everyone all the way down 
through the ages. So that those are my thoughts there, Corey. I appreciate your comment. Okay, speaking of God's wrath sometimes, we have another very, very different, you know, very different Corey. Very different Corey says, of course, this is all sarcastic, I know, but I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just talk about this anyway, because perhaps some of you would run across somebody who says this kind of thing. So let's talk about this just for a minute. Corey Palmer says, I don't reject God's slavery or, or child sacrifice or killing innocent people. Clearly, he's good. Okay, so of course, this is, he's, being, he's being very sarcastic here. Here's the thing. Uh, the truth of the matter is, you are either enslaved to good or you are enslaved to evil. It makes that very clear. It's either you are a slave of righteousness or you're a slave of sin. A lot of people out there in the, I'd say the vast majority of people in the world today are slaves of sin. So God doesn't, does not want that. Okay. He is a God of freedom. He wants you to be free from sin and a servant of him. Okay. Now I know, I know, you know, the specifics here. I know what you're hinting at there, Corey. Keep this in mind, quote unquote, God's slavery is nothing like what you think it is. You think you know? No, you don't, okay? We read about it in the scriptures that a lot of slaves, quote-unquote slaves, were treated so incredibly well and they were so incredibly blessed that when they were offered freedom, they refused it. They said, no, no way. I'm going to stay here, man. I'm telling you. And it tells you right there in the Torah what to do with these kind of slaves. And you know, they existed, you know, slaves exist. Why? Because God's people is God's people. Wonderful, wonderful people. I'm telling you, uh, I think a lot of quote unquote God's slaves uh, were much better off than a lot of us today. So it says in the Torah that such a, you know, such a slave that refuses to, to, to take freedom because he's got it better where he is under his quote unquote master, you know, he's supposed to go to the, the door frame and pierce his ear with the awl, okay? Uh, so that's to, it goes to say, it goes to show you that quote-unquote slaves back in those days were not treated as you thought they were treated. Oh, no. They were very, very blessed, it seems. Very, very blessed. To the point where they're like saying, <laughs> Uh, no thanks to freedom. I have it way better here. Okay? And that's the truth. Child sacrifice, what are you talking about? What are you talking about child sacrifice? No such thing. God is against that. Killing of innocent people as well. God is against that as well. Yes, there were people whom uh, God's judgment fell, and they certainly weren't innocent people. So to say, uh, Corey, uh, what I would say to this is like, is this a contest to put as much lies and inconsistencies and inaccuracies, untruths as much as possible into one comment or what? Because it sounds like that's what you're trying to do because it's not true, okay? It's not true. But it is true that he's good and he is very, very good and his mercy endures forever. Caballero, good to see you, brother. Caballero says, Shalom, brother. I apologize for my long absence, but I, I was having a very difficult time emotionally. No problem, Caballero. Uh, yeah, just Lord, uh, may the Lord strengthen you and fill you and uh, fill you with that glory and that peace. Um, blessings, brother. Good to see you. Good to see you. I've been thinking about you uh, quite often, actually, Caballero. So good to see you, brother. Blessings. Uh, okay, another video that I posted called These Are the Days of Micaiah. Quick little context here. These are the days of Micaiah. So if you go back into the um, book of First Kings, you have the story of the king of Israel and the king of Judah. And it's like, okay, we're going to go. Let's go take Ramoth Gilead. Let's go take the city of Ramoth, Ramoth Gilead. And, uh, and so the king of Judah is like, well, hmm you know what, maybe we should ask God first, you know, just to make sure that we're going to be on, we're going to win. Good idea, right? And so what did they do? They, they called all the prophets together. It says 400 prophets. Think about that for a minute. 400.
hundred prophets. How many do they, how many prophets do they need to get the, could, to get a word from God? You know, how many prophets? They, so they called four hundred prophets, and and they asked him, okay, what is God? You know, should should we go take Ramoth Gilead or not? They're like, yeah, I take Ramoth Gilead. God is going to give it into your hands. You're going to get the victory. You know, God is on your side. Yada yada yada. You know the whole thing. It's like the prosperity gospel, right? I mean, God is with you. He will never ever get angry with you, no matter what you do. It doesn't matter. You'll never ever. You can never do anything that would cause him to withdraw his blessing. Oh no, just you know, blessings all the time. Just bless, bless, bless all the time unconditionally, which I don't think that that's the case. But anyways, thank God, you know, we have uh, one of those kings were like, hmm, I know we asked 400 prophets, but it's something It's like I got a little inkling in me that tells me that there might be someone else that would give us a 401st opinion. Uh, there might be another, there might be another prophet that has something perhaps a little bit different to say other than these 400, you know, soothsayers. Soothsayers prophesying all these blessings all the time to us. And so it's like, yeah, there's one more. There's one more. It's Micaiah. But you don't want to talk to Micaiah, okay? He's always saying things that are, it's not good. I mean, you know, you don't, leave, leave Micaiah where he is, okay? Because, you know, he, he may not tell you something that's, that you want to hear. It might not be what you want to hear. Okay. So you might, no, no, call him in anyway. So they got Micaiah and Micaiah said, God is not with you. <laughs> the opposite to what the 400 said, God is not with you. If you go, you're going to lose your life. Wow. But you know what the Kings did? They said, mm, okay, well, we're going to believe the 400 and not the one. 400 to 1. That's quite outnumbered, isn't it? So, yeah, the vast majority uh, win here. Uh, so, you know, the bandwagon fallacy. I'll talk about that a little bit later, by the way. The bandwagon fallacy. The bandwagon fallacy. You know, all 400 prophets say yay and only one says nay. So uh, what would you do? What would you do? If you ask 400 prophets about a decision that you're going to make and 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 four all 400 tells you yeah do it god says he's with you and he's he's blessing you and all this kind of stuff. he's going to be with you and you're going to get the victory victory you know and one one lone straggler says no it's not going to happen in fact you're going to you're going to go down in defeat pretty seriously okay what would you do they went with the 400, and of course, you know what happened? The king of Israel lost his life. Yeah, so these are the days of Micaiah. This is what I was saying in that video. These are the days of Micaiah, meaning that, unfortunately, in the, in the church today, there are a lot of these prophets, quote-unquote prophets, that prophesy smooth things to you. Oh, they'll tell you, they'll just tell you about the blessings and the love of God and nothing. Oh, they'll never mention sin. Oh, they'll never mention the commandments. Oh, no. It's just bless, bless, bless. And, it, you know, it's just all just rose garden, prosperity, and health all the way. God is with you no matter what you do. God will never get angry with you. But we do have... The odd Micaiah out there, one in one out of 401, okay? One Micaiah. We have the odd one out there that actually tells you the truth, and it's things that maybe it's not all that pleasant to hear. So that's the, uh, the gist of that video. And so, anyways, we have our good uh, GRCH500 says facts. Facts. Thank you very much, GRCH. Appreciate your comment. Yes. And one more comment here before we get into the critical thinking segment. Again, after that, Hannah will come back and then we'll dive right into Josephus. So um, I, I don't want to mispronounce your screen name there, but sir, I will read what you have to say, interstate. Thank you and more, please. I'm where we are still waiting for you to write a book, write a book. Yeah, well, one of these days, Lord willing, I, you know, I, that's one of the things I, I do want to 
check off for sure. Write a book. Yes, Lord willing, by the power and the grace of God, perhaps that will happen. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Corey talks. Corey says uh, these slaves existed to help pay off their debts. Uh, I think there was other reasons too on top of that. But the uh, the Bible explains the amount of pain you give a slave determines if that slave is set free. And by the amount of pain, I mean the damage it may bring. It says if you hit a slave and they lo and they lose a tooth, you just set them free. Yeah. Yeah. Corey says, I also have a comment on one of your videos. I'm not sure if you were here earlier, but I did read one of your comments. I did read one of your comments there uh, talking about God is slow to anger. So I read that and I responded to that. So I'm not sure if you were here or not. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yes. Critical thinking tip. I promised that I would get to this, and this would be the bandwagon fallacy. Bandwagon fallacy. You know, whenever you hear, hear you see the word fallacy or hear the word fallacy, usually that means that does not mean, or that does not necessarily mean, right? So, for example, the ad hominem fallacy, right? Well, if you attack somebody else's character. So just because somebody is an idiot doesn't mean that does not mean that what they say is false. It could be that they're telling the truth. So whether a person is, you know, a bad guy or not, or an evil person, or just a whatever, you can call them whatever kind of name you want to call them. It doesn't mean that what they say is false. Anyways, um, ban bag... <laughs> Excuse me, ban bandwagon fallacy. I'm trying to say it fast. Uh, bandwagon fallacy is, I'm reading from, uh, let me see, this website, uh, Alex Excelsior University Home website to give credit where credit's due here. Bandwagon fallacy. The bandwagon fallacy is sometimes called the appeal to common belief or uh, to appeal to the masses because it's all about getting people to do or think something because everyone else is doing it or everything else or everything else thinks this. Example, everyone is going to get a new smartphone when it comes out this weekend. Why aren't you? Uh, so we got some comics here to to explain it, but it says here, of course, the problem with this fallacy is not not everyone is actually doing this, okay? But there is another problem that's important to point out. Just because a lot of people think something or do something does not mean it's right or good to do. For example, in the 16th century, most people believe the earth was the center of the universe. Of course, believing that, believing that did not make it true. Uh, you you want to be careful to avoid this fallacy as it as it's easy to fall into this kind of thinking. It, you know, it's almost like trusting in other people's judgment or trusting in other people's thoughts as opposed to your own. Like, well, you know, it's 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 almost like like you don't want to think for yourself, but you everybody else thinks for you. It's like, well, they think this, so therefore it's got to be right. I'm I'm going to think it too because everybody else thinks that. Let me just say this as well. Just because everyone thinks something or does something doesn't make it true or good. In the same way, just because everyone thinks something or does something doesn't always doesn't make doesn't mean that it's bad either. Okay, you got to look at it both ways. Because some people, t you know, look at it from the other the other side of the coin. Basically, well, everyone's doing that. It's got to be bad. Everybody's given to the poor. It's got to be bad because everybody's doing it. No, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean it's bad. You know, everybody's breathing. It's got to be bad. No. See, that, that, so that's the other side of the bandwagon fallacy. So just because everyone is doing it doesn't mean it's good and right. And at the same time, it doesn't mean it's bad either. 
Okay, so we need to make our judgments on whether something is good or true versus bad and false, not based upon whether everyone is doing it or not, but on other uh, other evidence that we need to use to to weigh out. It says, think about what your parents asked you when you insisted that everyone was doing something that that you were you were not getting to do. Quote, if every one of your friends jump off a cliff, would you? Unquote. It's important to fight the urge to fall into a bandwagon fallacy. Yes, amen to that. All right. See if we have Hannah here available to, uh, yeah, so I see Hannah is available here to come and play a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about Josephus. We're going to get it. It's going to be like an introduction, getting into the uh, antiquities of the Jews. Very, very interesting. And so, yeah, for the next few minutes, uh, Hannah is going to bless us with some live music. Hannah?
Thank you, Hannah. Beautiful, beautiful, as always. Thank you for blessing us with your talent, as always. It's awesome. Yeah, so Josephus. Josephus, all my Christian days, okay? I've heard about Josephus, and I'm sure most of you have heard about Josephus as well. You've heard the name, and uh, you've you've heard him... Uh, you heard about his works mentioned. I've heard about him uh, for the past thirty years. So um, this is a this is the first video in which we are getting into his, some of his writings, the antiquity of the Jews. And so we'll talk a little bit about Josephus, his background, who he is, when he lived, all that kind of thing. Tammy says, "Wow, wow, wow, Hannah." There you go, Tammy. I mean, Hannah. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> okay, uh, so Josephus lived in the first century just, just after the time of Yeshua, just after the time of, of Jesus. So uh, he was born, they believed, at AD 37, and uh, he passed away at around the year 100. So he would have been there right in the, right in the heat of things, right after, you know, just after uh, Yeshua, Yeshua walked this earth. Very, very interesting. And he uh, witnessed the destruction of the temple and all that kind of thing. And so he wrote about that as well in the book that he called The Wars of the Jews which you know, maybe sometime in the, in the near future, we'll read that as well. So Josephus, Josephus was born in Jerusalem, and his father was a very interesting guy. Uh, he w his father's name was Matthias, and he was a Jewish priest uh, 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 from the order of uh, Jehoiarib, Jehoiarib, which we read of in First Chronicles chapter 24. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 24 mentions Jehoiarib or Jehoiarib, uh, which is actually one of the progenitors of Josephus. And his mother was uh, from royal uh, descendants, uh, um, from a royal line too. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, he's, he grew up in a very wealthy, uh, famous family. And uh, so he set out to to write a lot of this stuff uh, about the uh, the history of the Jewish people. And uh, of course, he goes through all of the scriptures and all that kind of thing, similar to what, how Philo did in a different way, of course, and from a different point of view, of course. And uh, he also wrote the Wars of the Jews as well, uh, dealing with uh, uh, primarily with the war that... Um, Ended with the destruction of the temple. So I'm going to be reading here from a website called Gutenberg.org. Gutenberg.org, again, giving, giving credit where credit's due here. And I'm reading the antiquities of the Jews. So uh, let me see if I can pull this up. The Antiquities of the Jews, by Flavius Josephus. Okay, and I'm going to start out right with the right with the preface. Those who undertake to write histories do not, I perceive, take that trouble on one and the same account, but for many reasons, and those such as are very different one from another. For some of them apply themselves to this part of learning to show their skill in composition and that they may therein acquire a reputation for speaking finely. Others of them there are who write histories in order to gratify those that happen to be concerned in them on, account, or on that account having spared no pains but rather gone beyond their own abilities in, their, in the performance. But others there are who, of necessity and by force, are driven to write history, 
because they are concerned in the facts and so cannot excuse themselves from being from committing them to writing for the advantage of posterity. Nay, there are not a few who are induced to draw their historical facts out of darkness into light and to produce them for the benefit of the public on account of the great importance of the facts themselves which, with which they, they have been concerned. Now, of these several reasons for writing history, I must profess the, last, the two last were my own reasons also. For since I was myself interested in that war which the Jews had with the Romans and knew myself its particular actions and what conclusion it had, I was forced to give the history of it because I saw that others perverted the truth of those actions in their writings. Now I have undertaken the present work as thinking it will, uh, it will appear to all the Greeks worthy of their study, for it will contain all our antiquities and the constitution of our government as interpreted out of the Hebrew scriptures. And indeed, I did formerly intend, when I wrote of the war, to explain who the Jews originally were, what fortunes they had been subject to, and by what legislat legislature they had been instructed in piety and the exercise of other virtues, what wars also they had made in remote ages till they were unwillingly engaged in the last with the Romans. But because this work would take up a great compass, I separated it to, into a set treatise by myself, or by itself, excuse me, with, with a beginning of its own and its own conclusion. But in process of time, as usually happens to such as undertake great things, I grew weary and went on slowly, it being a large project and a difficult thing to translate our history into a foreign and, and to us, a unaccustomed language. However, some persons there were who desired to know our history and so exhorted me to go, to go on with it. And above all the rest, Epaphroditus, a man who is a lover of all kind of learning, but is principally delighted with the knowledge of history. And this on account of his having been himself concerned in great affairs and many turns of fortune and having shown a wonderful rigor of an excellent nature and an immovable virtuous resolution in them all. I yielded to this man's persuasions, who always excites such, uh, such as have abilities in what is useful and acceptable to join their endeavors with his. I was also ashamed myself to permit any laziness of disposition to have a greater influence upon me than the delight of taking pains in such studies as were very useful. I thereupon stirred up myself and went on with my work more cheerfully. Besides the foregoing motives, I have I had others which I had which I greatly reflected upon, and these were that our forefathers were willing to communicate such things to others, and that some of the Greeks took considerable pains to know the affairs of our nation. I found, therefore, that the second of the Ptolemies was a king who was extraordinarily diligent in what concerned learning and the collection of books, that he was also peculiarly am, uh, excuse me, ambitious to procure a translation of our law and of the constitution of our government therein contained into the Greek tongue. Now Eliezer, the high priest, one not inferior to 
any other of that dignity among us, did not envy the forenamed king the participation of that advantage, which otherwise he would for certain have denied him, but that he knew the custom of our nation was to hinder nothing of what we esteemed ourselves from being communicated to others. Accordingly, I thought it became, excuse me, accordingly, I thought it became me both to imitate the generosity of our high priest and to suppose there might even now be many lovers of learning like the king. For he did not obtain all our writings at that time, but those who were sent to Alexandria as interpreters gave him only the books of the law, while there were a vast number of other matters in our sacred books. They, indeed, contain in them the history of 5,000 years, in which time happened many strange accidents, many chances of war, and great actions of the commanders, and mutations of the form of our government. Upon the whole, a man that will peruse this history may principally learn from it that all events succeed well, even to an incredible degree. And the reward of felicity is suppo- is proposed by God. But then it is to those who follow his will and do not venture to break his excellent laws. And that so far as men any way apostatize from the accurate observation of them what was practical before becomes impractical and whatsoever they set about as a good thing is converted into an incurable calamity. And now I exhort all those that peruse these books to apply their minds to God and to examine the mind of our legislator, whether he had not understood He has not understood his nature in a manner worthy of him and has not ever ascribed to him such operations as become his power and has not preserved his writings from those indecent uh, fables which others have framed, although by the great distance of time when he lived, he might have securely forged such lies For he lived 2,000 years ago, at which vast distance of ages the prophets themselves have not been so hardy as to fix even the generations of their gods, much less the actions of their men or their own laws. As I proceed, therefore, I shall accurately describe what is contained in our records, in the order of time that belongs to them, for I have already promised so to do throughout this undertaking and this without adding anything to what is therein contained or taking away anything therefrom but because almost all of our constitution depends on the wisdom of moses our legislator i cannot avoid saying somewhat concerning him beforehand though i shall do it briefly I mean, because otherwise those that read my book may wonder how it comes to pass that my discourse, which promises an amount or promises an account of laws and historical facts, contains much of philosophy. The reader is therefore to know that Moses deemed it exceeding necessary that he would conduct his own life well and give laws to others in the first place, should consider the divine nature and upon the contemplation of God's operations should thereby imitate the best of all patterns so far as it it is possible for human nature to do and to endeavor to follow after it. Neither could the legislator himself have a right mind without such a contemplation nor would anything he should write tend to the promotion of 
virtue in his readers. I mean, unless they, unless they be taught first of all that the that God is the Father and Lord of all things, and sees all things, and that thence he bestows a happy life upon those that follow him. But plunges such as do not walk in the paths of virtue into inevitable miseries. Now, when Moses was desirous to teach this lesson to his countrymen, he did not begin the establishment of his laws after the same manner that other legislators did. I mean, upon contracts and other rights between one man and another, but by raising their minds upwards to regard God and his creation of the world, and by persuading them that we men are the most excellent of the creatures of God upon earth. Now, when once he had brought them to submit to religion, he easily persuaded them to submit in all other things. For as to other le- for as to other legislators, they followed fables, and their discourses transferred the most reproach- reproachful of human vices unto the gods and afforded wicked men the most plausible excuses for their crimes. But as for our legislator, when he had once demonstrated that God was possessed of perfect virtue, he supposed that men also ought to strive after the participation of it. And on those who did not so think and so believe, he inflicted the severest punishments. I exhort, therefore, my readers to examine this whole undertaking in that view. For thereby it will appear to them that there is nothing therein disagreeable either to the majesty of God or to his love to mankind. For all things have here a reference to the nature of the universe, while our legislator speaks some things wisely, but enigmatically, and others under a a decent allegory, but still explains such things as required a direct explication plainly and expressly. However, those that have a mind to know the reasons of everything may find here a very curious philosophy, excuse me, philosophical theory, which I now indeed shall waive the explication of. But if God afford me time for it, I will set about writing it after I have finished the present work. I shall now betake myself to the history before me after I have first mentioned what Moses says to the creation or of the creation of the world, which I find described in the sacred books after the manner following. Okay, let's get the footnotes. Book one, containing the interval of 3,833 years from the creation to the death of Isaac. Chapter one, the constitution of the world and the disposition of the elements. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but when the earth did not come into sight, but was covered with thick darkness and a wind moved upon its surface, God commanded that there should be light. And when that was made, he considered the whole mass and separated the light and the darkness. And the name he gave to one was night and the other he called day. And he named the beginning of light and the time of rest. The evening and the morning And this was indeed the first day. But Moses said it was one day, the cause of which I am able to give even now. But because I have promised to give such reasons for all things in a treatise by by itself, 
I shall put off its exposition till that time. After this, on the second day, he placed the heaven over the whole world and separated it from the other parts, and he determined it should stand by itself. He also placed a crystalline firmament around it and put it together in a, man in a manner agreeable to the earth and fitted it for giving moisture and rain and for affording the advantage of dews. On the third day, he appointed the dry land to appear with the sea itself around, round about it. And on the very same day, he made the plants and the seeds to spring out of the earth. On the fourth day, he, or, he adorned the heaven with the sun, the moon, and the other stars, and appointed them their, their motions and courses that the vicissitudes of the seasons might be clearly signified. And on the fifth day, he produced the living creatures, both, that, both those that swarm and those that fly, the former in the sea and the latter in the air. He also sorted them as to society and mixture for procreation and that their kinds might, in, might increase and multiply. On the sixth day, he created the four-footed beasts and made them male and female. On the same day, he also formed man. Accordingly, Moses says that in just six days, the world and all that is therein was made, and that the seventh day was a rest and a release from the, from the labor of such operations. Whence, whence it is that we celebrate a rest from our labors on that day and call it the Sabbath, which word denotes rest in the Hebrew tongue. Moreover, Moses, after the seventh day was, was over, begins to, to talk philosophically and concerning the formation of man, says thus, that God took dust from the ground and formed man and inserted in him a spirit and soul. This man was called Adam, which in the Hebrew tongue signifies one that is red, because he was formed out of red earth, compound together, compounded together, for of that kind is virgin and true earth. God also presented the living creatures when he had made them according to their kinds, both male and female, to Adam, who gave them those names by which they are still called. And when he saw that Adam had no female companion, no society, for there was no such created, and that he wondered at the other animals, which were male and female, he laid him asleep and took away one of his ribs, and out of it formed the woman, whereupon Adam knew her when, uh, when she was brought to him and acknowledged that she was made out of himself. Now a woman is called in the Hebrew tongue Isa, but the name of this woman was Eve which signifies the mother of all living. Moses says further that God planted a paradise in the east, flourishing with all sorts of trees, that among them was the tree of life and another of knowledge, whereby was to be known what, is, what was good and evil, and that when he brought Adam and his wife into this garden, he commanded them to take care of the plants. Now the garden was watered by one river, which ran about the whole earth, and was parted into four parts. And Fison, or Fison, which denotes a multitude running into India, makes its exit into the sea and is by the Greeks called Ganges, Ganges. Euphrates also, as well as Tigris, goes down into the Red Sea. Now, the name Euphrates, or Frath, denotes either a dispersion or a, 
a flower. By Tigris, or Diglath, is signified what is swift, with narrowness. And Gion runs through Egypt and denotes what arises from the east, which the Greeks call Nile. God therefore commanded that Adam and his wife should eat of all the rest of the plants, but to abstain from the tree of knowledge, and foretold to them that if they touched it, it would prove their destruction. But while all the living creatures had one language at that time, the serpent, which then lived together with Adam and his wife, showed an envious disposition and his supposal of their living happily and in obedience to the commands of God and imagining that when they disobeyed them, they would fall into calamities. He persuaded the woman out of a malicious intention to taste of the tree of knowledge, telling them that in that tree was the knowledge of good and evil, which which knowledge when they should obtain, they would lead a happy life, nay, a life not inferior to that of a god. By which means he overcame the woman and persuaded her to despise the command of God. Now, when she had tasted of that tree and was pleased with its fruit, she persuaded Adam to make use of it also. Upon this, they perceived that they were become naked to one another, and being ashamed thus to appear abroad, they invented somewhat to cover them, for the tree sharpened their understanding, and they covered themselves with fig leaves, and trying these before them, or excuse me, and tying these before them, out of modesty, they thought they were happier than they were before, as they had discovered that they were in want of or what they were in want of. But when God came into the garden, Adam, who was wont before to come and to and converse with him, being conscious of his wicked behavior, went out of the way. This behavior super, surprised God, and he asked what the cause of this his procedure and why he that before delighted in that conversation, now uh, did now fly from it and avoid it. When he made no reply, as conscious to himself that he had transgressed the command of God, God said, quote, I had before determined about you both how you might lead a happy life without any affliction and care and vexation of soul, and that all things which might contribute to your enjoyment and pleasure should grow up by my providence and of their own accord without your own labor and painstaking, which state of labor and painstaking would soon bring on old age and death would not only would not be any at any remote distance. But now you have abused this, my goodwill. And have disobeyed my commands. For your silence is not the sign of your virtue, but it is your evil conscience. Unquote. However, Adam excused his sin and entreated God not to be angry at him, and laid the blame of what was done upon his wife, and said that he was deceived by her, and thence became an offender while she again accused the serpent, but God allotted him punishment because he weakly submitted to the counsel of his wife and said the ground should not henceforth yield its fruit of its own accord, but that when it should be harassed by their labor, it should bring forth some of its fruits and refuse to bring forth others. He also made Eve liable to the inconveniency of breeding and the sharp pains of bringing forth children and this because she persuaded Adam with the same arguments wherewith the serpent had persuaded her and had thereby brought him into 
cal uh, calamitous, calamitous condition. He also deprived the serpent of speech out of indignation at his malicious disposition towards Adam. Besides this, he inserted poison under his tongue and made him an enemy to men and suggested to them that they should direct their strokes against his head and that being that being the place wherein he, uh, lay his mischievous mischievous uh, designs toward men and it being easiest to take vengeance on him that way and when he had deprived him of the use of his feet he made him to go rolling all around and dragging himself upon the ground and when God had a appointed these penalties for them, he removed Adam and Eve out of the garden into another place. One more chapter, then this will be it for the night. Chapter 2. Concerning the posterity of Adam and the ten generations from him to the deluge. Adam and Eve had two sons. The elder of them was named Cain, which name, when it is interpreted, signifies a possession. The younger was Abel, which signifies sorrow. They had also daughters. Now, the two brethren were pleased with different courses of life. For Abel, the younger, was a true lover of righteousness. And believing that God was present in all his actions, he excelled in virtue and his employment was that of a shepherd. But Cain was not only very wicked in other respects, but was wholly intent on get upon getting and he and he first contrived to plow the ground he slew his brother on the on the occasion following they had resolved to sacrifice to god now cain brought the fr the fruits of the earth and of his husbandry but abel brought milk and the first fruits of his flocks. And God was more delighted with the latter ob oblation when he was honored with what was with what grew naturally on a excuse me. When he was honored when with what was when he was honored with what grew naturally of its own accord, then he was with then he was with what was invention of a covetous man and gotten by forcing the ground whence it was that Cain was very angry that Abel was preferred by God before him and he slew his brother and hid his dead body thinking to escape discovery but God knowing what had been done came to Cain and asked him what was become of his brother because he had not seen him for many days, whereas he used, he used to observe them conversing together at other times. But Cain was in doubt within himself and knew not what answer to give to God. At first he said that he was himself at a loss about his brother's disappearing, but when he was provoked by God, who pressed him vehemently, as resolving to know what the matter was, he replied, he was not his brother's guardian or keeper, nor was he an observer of what he did. But in return, God convicted Cain as having been the murderer of his brother and said, quote, I wonder at you that you know not what has become of a man whom you yourself have destroyed, unquote. God, therefore, did not inflict the punishment of death upon him on account of his offering sacrifice and therefore, and thereby making supplication to him not to be extreme in his wrath to him, but he made him accursed and threatened his posterity in the seventh generation. He also cast him together with his wife out of that land and when he was afraid that in wandering about he should fall among wild beasts and by that means perish, 
God bid him not to entertain such a melancholy, sus- mel- melancholy suspicion and to go over all the earth without fear of what mischief might suffer f- uh, he might suffer from wild beasts and setting a mark upon him that he might be known. He commanded him to depart. And when Cain had traveled over many countries, he, with his wife, built a city named Nod, or Node, which is a place so called, and there he settled his abode, where, where also he had children. However, he did not accept his punishment in order to, uh, in order to amendment, but to increase his wickedness. For he only aimed to procure everything that was for his own bodily pleasure, though it obliged him to be injurious to his neighbors. He augmented his household substance with, with much wealth by rapine and violence. He excited his acquaintance to procure pleasures and spoils by robbery and became a great leader of men into wicked courses. He also introduced a change in that way of simplicity wherein men lived before and was the author of of measures and weights. And whereas he lived innocently and generously while they knew nothing of such arts, he changed the world into cunning craftiness. He, first of all, set boundaries about lands He built a city and fortified it with walls, and he compelled his family to come gather to it and called that city Enoch after the name of his eldest son, Enoch. Now, Jared was the son of Enoch, whose whose son was Malaliel, whose son was Methuselah, whose son was Lamech, who had 77 children by two wives, Selah and Ada. Of those children, by Ada, was one was Jabal, or Yabal. He erected tents and loved the life of a shepherd. But Yabal, or Jabal, who was born of the same mother with him, exercised himself in music and invented the psaltery and the harp. But Tubal, one of his children by the other wife, exceeded all men in strength and was very expert and famous in martial performances. He procured what tended to the pleasures of the body by that method, and first of all invented the art of making brass. Lamech was also the father of a daughter, whose name was Naamah. And because he was so skillful in matters of divine revelation, that he knew he was to be punished for Cain's murder of his brother. Uh, He made that known to his wives. Nay, even while Adam was alive, it came to pass that the posterity of Cain became exceeding wicked. Every one successively dying, one after another, more wicked than the former. They were intolerable in war and vehement in robberies. And if any one were slow to murder people, yet he was bold in in his pro, profligate, profligate behavior in acting unjustly and doing injuries for gain. Now Adam, who was the first man and made out of the earth, for our discourse must now be about him. After Abel was slain and and Cain fled away on account of his murder, was Cilicius, excuse me, solicitous for pros, pros, uh, posterity, and had a vehement desire of children he being 230 years old, after which time he lived other 700 and then died. He had indeed many other children, but Seth in particular, 
As for the rest, it would be tedious to name them. I will therefore only endeavor to give account give an account of those that proceeded from Seth. Now, this Seth, when he was brought up and came to those years in which he could discern what was good, became a virtuous man. And as he was himself of an excellent character, so did he leave children behind him who imitated his virtues. All these proved to be of good dispositions. They also inhabited the same country without dissensions and in a happy condition, without any misfortunes falling upon them till they died. They also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order, and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water, they made two pillars, the one of brick and the other of stone. They inscribed their discoveries on them both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain and the exhibit and exhibit those discoveries to mankind and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now this remains in the land of Syria to this day. All right. Amen, amen, amen. So that concludes our reading for, uh, from Josephus, the Antiquity, the Antiquities of the Jews for tonight. Very, very interesting as always. Very, very interesting. So many things come to mind as I'm reading it and I'm thinking, should I just keep reading or should I, should we stop and talk about it? Hey, you guys, if I'm reading something and something that you guys see, you want, you got questions, you want to talk about it, feel free to add, you know, to uh, drop that in the live chat and that'll, uh, we'll get to it after the reading. Of course, we have Callie. Callie says, hi, everyone. Hello, Callie. Welcome. Good to see you. Blessings. John says, do you think God loves animals as much as he loves people? No, uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, only people are made in his image, right? And uh, I think that even Yeshua kind of made that uh, point as well. And he's like, well, you know, the animal, the animal, the birds, you know, uh, they're not worth as much as you are. And God's concerned about the birds. Well, he's concerned about the birds. Yeah, he's, con he's concerned about the animals. But he's not so concerned about the birds as much as, as he is concerned about you. you know, the animals are the animals, right? But people are not only made in his image, but at least the few of us, at least, you know, I pray that every one of you are a child of God. So yes, that would, that would certainly warrant a lot more love. Does he love bugs and insects too? That's a, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I know that there are some people in the world, um, not going to mention exactly their, there are some people that believe that uh, even bacteria and germs are to be protected. I don't, I'm not one of these people, but there are some people that believe that um, I've heard that there are people in the world. I'm sure some of you know this, that will not wash their hands. They will not take a bath. They will not take a shower. They won't wash at all because they're afraid that they might be killing God's precious creatures that are on them. <laughs> but Hey, there are people who believe that. Uh, no, I, I don't think, um, I mean, to a certain degree. I mean, he, God created insects and bugs for a reason as well. Okay. Uh, but he gave, uh, he gave us as in the human race authority uh, over uh, at least to a certain degree authority to subdue the world and to 
you know, we got, if we got a problem with bugs, we have to do something to, with, you know? And so, uh, yeah, I think that our, our point of view should be more to love and forgive our enemies as opposed to let me loving and loving bugs. I think that's more of God's heart. Because, you know, I think a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on other things and then they hate, they hate their neighbor. You know, it's like, I love, I love this particular creature, but I hate my neighbor. I, th I think that's a little bit kind of nah, off, off balance. A lot of these questions, John, are very, uh, very involved questions. Uh, like, for example, does e does everything happen for a reason? Well, um, it depends on how you look at it. Yes and no. Okay, uh, depends de depending on how you look at it. Now, does everything happen? Well, so let's talk about the yes. Okay, again, I don't. We can talk all night about this, and but uh, talk about the yes. So when things happen, it's it's a. I would have to ask you, John, to be specific about what things you're talking about because you know there are billions of different things that can happen, and. You know, some of them are good and some of them are not so good. I think at the, at the end of the day, um, as long as we are doing what, what God wants us to do, as long as we are on the right track, as long as we're doing everything we can possibly do uh, to obey him, I think we need to trust. Be like Joseph. Right? Look at all the things that happened to Joseph in his life. Like how many people could survive what Joseph survived and without, without going into, without getting into like, you know, a bad attitude against God. You know what I mean? Like, so Joseph was beaten up, left for dead by his own family, thrown into a pit, sold as a slave, framed, in, wrongly imprisoned. I mean, on and on and on it goes, but yet he did not hold a grudge. He, he didn't get angry with God. He trusted that whatever God, whatever happened, God would turn it around for the good. And, it, and eventually that's what happened, right? Uh, Joseph's uh, faith and his patience and his attitude brought him to the place of being probably the most, if not the second most powerful man in all of the world. John asked the question again, does God love everyone? What do you mean by love? Okay, I let me ask you that. What do you mean by love? Love is so ambiguous. Okay, so just so you know, De depending on how you define love, you could say yes or you could say no. Depending on how you define love, what do you mean by love? Excellent questions, by the way, John. Thank you for asking. I mean, these are very deep and uh, very, very good questions. Caballero says, very interesting reading tonight. I've never read the, the, the writings of Josephus. See you tomorrow. Okay, then. Caballero, blessings, blessings to you. As always, good to see you, brother. I'm glad that you enjoyed the reading for tonight. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Gnostic Native says, What do you think Josephus meant by pointing out that it was one day instead of the first day in the creation account at the beginning of the reading? Another excellent question. Wow, you guys are full of good questions tonight. Yeah, excellent. You see, so in the in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter one, where it says day one, you know, because you got this you know, day one, day two, day three, day four, you know, 
it's very interesting because it doesn't say day one. <laughs> it doesn't say day rishon. It says day achad, okay, in the Hebrew. So the Hebrew word that's used there doesn't mean first or one. Like in, for example, counting one, two, three, four, five, but rather it means one in the sense of unity, like echad, the Lord our God is is one echad, or an uh, if you have like a, a a million things all together into one, you would say it's echad, right? You wouldn't say it's one million into one unit, but it's rather it's 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 echad. So it's echad. Uh, is not the Hebrew word for first or one in that sense, but rather it's talking about unity. Okay. Um, it's very deep. Uh, like for example, okay, so I went into a lot of this um, several weeks ago when I, uh, there's a video that I, that I entitled, um, Does Genesis Chapter 1 uh, Support Flat Earth? That's, the name of the video. And in that video, I go through what that means specifically. Uh, I'll give you just a little bit of a appetizer because it, it is, it, it actually, I took a whole video on talking about this kind of thing. A little bit of an appetizer on that is that here's, here's the thing. What does the word day mean in Genesis chapter one? Personally, I do not believe it means a 24-hour day. Personally, I do not subscribe to the idea that it actually means any particular amount of time chronologically. And I'll tell you why. Because in Genesis chapter 1, it says that God, cre God said, let there be light, let there be or. Okay, so this was before the sun was created, okay, according to Genesis chapter 1. Let there be or. If you look throughout the the the, uh, the scriptures, in other places in the scripture where it uses that word "or," it can mean word of God, not not necessarily the light that you see, but it's more like knowledge or revelation, um, illumination, spiritually speaking, not physically, not anything that you can see with your human eyes like revelation, like the light of God's um, glory, the light of God's vision of revelation. It's hard to explain. Spiritual enlightenment, okay? Spiritual revelation, the light of God. So it had nothing to do with physical light. It had nothing to do with the light from a candle or, or the sun or the moon or anything like that. It had nothing to do with that at all. It had everything to do with the word of God, the revelation of God, God's word speaking forth. So if day one were a chronological day, that means that at the end of that day, God's light went out. But I don't think so, because it talks about God, the light of God, the ore of God being eternal, right? The, the light of God is sh shining right now. God, we're in day one right now. We're, we're, I mean, the light of God, the ore of God's revelation, his presence, his glory, his word, his knowledge is, is, is going out now. So day one never ended, right? So that's why... It says Echad day, as opposed to Rishon day. Rishon day would be like first day, first day. No, it's not first day. It's eternal day. Um, yeah, I don't know how else to uh, to describe that, uh, other than what I I went into more detail in that other video that I just mentioned. I went into more detail about that. So. Yeah, it's very interesting. You read it in Hebrew, the word that's used for where it says day one or the first day, how some translators translate it as the first day, it's really not first per se. It's echad, meaning that that day, that or encompassed all other days. So it's the all-inclusive unity of God's revelation, 
glory, power, word, everything. Torah, if you will, right? The, your Torah, your law is light, is or. It's all there. It's all inclusive. It's all included in that first day. Excellent question, Gnostic native. Thank you for asking. Going nowhere to ask the question, why? wonder what God would say about killing bugs and insects. They are supposedly his creation after all. Yeah, but bugs and insects can kill you and can destroy your house and destroy everything. And what would he say about that, right? What would he say about that too? And uh, and can eat up your crops. So you're, you have no food to eat, okay? <laughs> no food to eat. How many times has that happened in history where you got like, you know... Uh, you know, the locusts come in and phew, nothing, you got nothing, you know, so that would, that would wipe out all of human, all of humanity there. If, if you didn't uh, keep those bugs at bay, that's for sure. So I think that, uh, you know, God, as long as they're in their place, as long as they're, you know, they're not going to cause people harm. I don't think, you know, I think that there's, there's a time and place for it all going nowhere. Thank you. Gnostic native, another question. Do you think when Josephus said that, that Moses started speaking philo philosophically after the creation account, that he was implying that Torah is, alleg is allegory, not history? Ooh, you got some really good questions. Yeah, um, it reminds me a lot of Philo. Um, I've been reading Philo recently as well. And yeah, uh I do believe that that's what he's alluding to. Um, that it's a lot, it's very allegorical. Uh, uh, yeah, in I I do believe that the the first several chapters of Genesis is very allegorical. You know, I think that. Uh, Sometimes people take it a little bit too literally. And I've, it's, it's really, really interesting that you would brought this up because as I was reading that, I was thinking the same thing. I was actually, I was actually thinking the same thing. And after reading uh, some of Philo in the past few weeks, um, it seems like Philo took the same, the same point of view as well, that it's like a lot of it is allegorical, not necessarily historical. So, yeah, it, it's it's amazing. Um, it's very interesting how these ancient um, men read and understood the scriptures. Yeah, I I really think it's it's interesting. So that's my thoughts on that Gnostic native. Gnostic native says thank you for the explanation about day. That makes sense. And gives me a lot better understanding. Well, thank you for asking. And again, one more thing too. If you read it in the in Genesis chapter one, it says he called the or day. He called the or day, the light day. Right. So it's not really light per se. It's not like a twenty four hour day like we what we have now. It's rather his his word, his revelation. So it, it that brings a total a totally different. Um, interpretation, doesn't it? I mean, it brings a totally different, it just opens up an, another world of interpretation. Once you look at it like that, it's like, okay, so day one is not really a 24-hour day or a thousand-year day or whatever you want to call it. It's it's an or. It tells you right there, he called, it, he called the or day. It doesn't say he called the 24-hour day. It doesn't say he called the millennia, the millennium day, the, you know, a thousand years. It says he called the or day. So it's that, it's that spiritual, talk about like, like allegorical. It's that spiritual light. He says that's day. Very interesting. John says, what do you think that God would say about killing animals? 
Well, I mean, you got it all the way through the Torah. Uh, you know, there's, there's a time and place, again, for, for all of this. And people, and of course, we're, we're forbidden, you know, thou shalt not murder, okay? Um, yeah, so, I mean, we got all that stuff through the Torah there, John. You know, so, yeah, I think that God, uh, it, things are not as simplistic as a lot of people think. You know, I, the more I... Uh, the more I read the scriptures, the more I study, the more time goes by. It's for me, I I have been like seriously, seriously studying the scriptures for 30, over 30 years now, okay? Before that, I, I would read the Bible a little bit here and there, and you know, it's like a lot of people would, right? But I'm talking about seriously getting into the Hebrew and the Greek and studying it and just reading it and just diving in. It's been, it's been over 30 years now. And I'll tell you something, the more I read it, the more I study it, the more I see how it's not as simple as people think. It's not as simple, it's not as, simple as, I, as I thought it was. The more you read it, it's like, wait a second. No, it's not like one plus one equals two. It's, there's a, there's a, it's not like, you know, you can just, punching into a calculator and get an answer. A lot of times it's a lot, there's a lot more involved. A lot more involved. John says, what about war? Well, you know, as it says, it's, there's in, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes, there is a time for peace. There is a time for war. Um, in self-defense as well, I would certainly highly recommend you don't do anything that you don't have to do. Uh, you know, peace and, uh, you know, peace at as much as possibly feasibly, uh, can, you know, uh, can be. Like to, to That's always the goal is peace. Or an animal in self-defense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, again, you look at, for example, the, let me just, I'll, I'll just kind of overlap that with what, what the Torah talks about sacrifices. So, a lot of the sacrifices that we read of in the Torah, a lot of the, a lot of the animals that were uh, slaughtered in the Torah were not slaughtered for sin. They weren't slaughtered, they weren't slaughtered for atonement. The vast majority, most of them were slaughtered for food. It was for to feed the hungry, to feed the poor, the widows and the strangers and the Levites and those who had, you know, those had who needed food. That's what it was for. Yeah. So again, I think that as people who want to be blessed of God, we need to focus set our minds on the things that God uh, wants us to, and that is to, to love one another, to, to love your neighbor, to walk in forgiveness, in grace, in mercy, and everything else will fall in place. I mean, I, well, I mean you get the two greatest commandments, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all your resources, and then love your neighbors yourself. And then everything else will fall in place. A lot of people love other things a little bit too much. You know what I mean? So I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, we get our focus on that. Uh, John, what I would highly recommend is um, in your own spare time, your own personal time, just Pull out, maybe you have a Bible on you or you got an app on your phone or whatever the case is. Pull out and start reading on something and start reading it. And, you know, if it's something that is not interesting to you, then go to the next chapter, go to the next book, whatever. Find something in the scriptures that's interesting and, and read it. And as you read it, it will, you will, you'll discover more and more and more. And it'll get more and more interesting and you'll learn more and things will come together better for you. And so it's like, oh yeah, now I see the pictures coming together better and now I can understand it more. It takes a long, it takes a, you know, 
like I said to you myself, I'm not sure. Uh, I know each and every one that's watching this right now, y'all have your, you know, you're all at, uh, y'all experienced all kinds of different things. Um, uh, in my experience, it's been, it's been a long time in, in studying the scriptures. I'm, and I'm still learning a lot. I'm, the other day there, I was going through some of the, uh, some of the old videos, not old, actually, I shouldn't say old, like videos from two years ago, just, just two years ago. I'm like, wow, I, some of that stuff, I'm like, mm, I don't really, I don't look at it like that anymore. I don't look at it like that anymore. Well, there's one thing, there's one thing I don't really believe anymore. There's another thing I don't really believe. All right, now I found out something else. I found something else out. I've learned more, you know, I've learned, I've gathered more information. I've made more, uh, I made more progress in, in the knowledge of scripture and such. And it's amazing. It's amazing. It's never a dull moment. Like my grandmother used to always say, never a dull moment. And going nowhere. Weird question, but what do you think makes God laugh? So this would be, um, yeah. So we read about it in the Psalms. Um, what was it Psalm 2 was it Psalm 2 if I can remember correctly maybe I'm wrong just give me a second here yeah yeah it's Psalm 2 Proverbs 1 and Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Uh, let me see now. I'll start with verse 11. But the meek shall inherit the earth. You wonder, you wonder uh, where Jesus got the you know, the Sermon on the Mount from, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Well, there it is right there. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just. Wait a second, what's this? The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him for he sees that his day is coming. So there is one thing there going nowhere. What is What makes God laugh? Well, Wicked people that think that they can, you know, plot against the just. That's one thing. Uh, Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords, cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. There's another one. Again, uh, same kind of picture here of, you know, sinful, bad people uh, plotting against good people. God laughs at it. God laughs at it. And finally, we have uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, I'm trying to figure out where should I start here. Uh, okay. Uh, start at verse 22. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. T turn at my rebuke. Turn. So this is talking about repentance. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you and will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused... I stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. I will, I also will laugh at your calamity and will mock when your terror comes. Look at that. Hmm. Isn't that something? I do think that this could be talking about, let me see. 
So the question is there in that passage, who is I? I don't think it's Solomon, although he wrote it. I think I would be either wisdom, okay? Because many times in Proverbs it talks, it's like wisdom speaking first person. Other times I could be, well, it could be, someone could argue that it is God speaking. And going north says, there's, out, there's always more to learn. Guess the only one who knows everything is God since he's supposedly all-knowing. Yes, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to, uh, to read and to learn. Gnostic native, after reading Josephus, I wondered if Josephus is Paul. I noticed many similarities. Interesting, interesting. I've heard that before. I, I've, like in my own mind, I would say I, I'm not, I, I don't have any clear convictions on that, at least. I, I kind of, uh, you know, seeing that we have Josephus, there's a, there's quite, there's a lot of history with Josephus, like who he is, who his mother was, who his father was. So considering that evidence, like there's a lot of historical evidence as to exactly who he was and what family he came from and that kind of thing. I don't think, I think it's probably, I'm leaning away from that idea. I'm not completely, you know, saying I'm completely shutting my mind to it, but I'm kind of leaning away from that, especially since, okay, so they say that Josephus was born uh, circa 37 AD, died 100. I know it's about the same, but Paul, a lot of people believe that Paul was already a, you know, um, an adult man who already got saved by the time 37 AD came around. So, yeah, it's something to definitely look at, that's for sure. Uh, see, Native says, Paul talks about the mystery that was never before known, that was revealed to him. So I'm going to be peculiar, particularly listening during your study uh, to see if I notice Josephus seem to, seeming to know anything about Paul's doctrine. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah, now that you mention it, I'm going to be looking at it. Definitely going to be on my mind as uh, more as I read through it. That's for sure. Thank you. Going nowhere, do you read or study scripture every day, even outside of these streams? Yes, I do. Uh, I used to do it. I used to, what I'm doing on these streams, I used to do offline so i used to do it offline for a number of years and then so ever since i got a better internet connection praise god glory to god i'm like well instead of doing this offline why don't i just go online and and do it live and just have just have a party you know everybody just get blessed right and and we share with each other and and all this stuff yeah Gnostic Native says, true about who Josephus' family was, but isn't that really only reported by him? Is there other proof, evidence of Josephus and his family? Excellent question, as always. I, at this point in time, I'll have to say, oh, how, I'll have to look into it. I'll have to look into it myself and uh, see what we have. Uh, I'm not, uh, at this point in time, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't uh, give you as, a definitive answer on that. So we'll uh, we'll look into this. I'll have to get back to you on that one. Excellent question. Excellent question. Okay, so that'll wrap it up for tonight. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, same time, same place, we'll continue our reading of Josephus. Very, very interesting, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll continue all that. 
going nowhere. What's your favorite Bible translation? Not the not the one you think is the most authoritative, just one you like the most. Oh, I I I really you know, I don't know. Uh, it's like going into a candy shop and asking the uh what's your favorite candy? Well, at one time it's this one, another time it's the other one, and sometimes it's like all of them. It's um yeah, I, 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 it's hard to say uh, going nowhere. I mean, we read a lot from New King James and CSB and um, well, the WEB we read from before uh, a lot. Not to say that that's my favorite. I, I really can't say that I have a favorite. Now we, I always say just compare compare several different translations and that way you can get a little bit better of an idea of what certain translators you know the the decisions they made to translate different words give you a better idea Gnostic Native says this is why I'm so excited about doing a Josephus study yes oh man oh man yeah oh man awesome okay so that's it for tonight um Again, same time, same same place tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we'll continue reading from Josephus and talking about all this very interesting, uh, interesting things about Josephus. Okay. You guys are awesome. Keep on calling upon him and he will show you great and mighty things as Jeremiah says. And... Uh, Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. I'll see you again tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern. Amen, amen. Blessings multiplied to you guys. As always, I pray the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Lift up his countenance upon you. And give you wonderful, wonderful shalom. Amen, amen.